So we're going to go to Galatians chapter 4, Galatians chapter 4, and we're going to try to get through verse 11 tonight. And I titled this, Time to Grow Up. Time to Grow Up. And you say, oh, that's a little too far tonight, Pastor. Just back it off. I just want to relax and eat my pie and praise God for what he's done. I don't want to grow up. But aren't you thankful for some of the things that you don't have to go through that you went through earlier on in life? Anybody thankful for some of those things? Um, I am so happy that I am not potty training. You say, well, why, are you going, why, are you, why are you doing that? Well, my son is potty training, okay? And that is like, it's like a nightmare. I can't, I can't imagine trying to go through that ever again. Today we were in a restaurant, and, uh, and he had to go. And when he has to go... You, you run as fast as you possibly can. You move. You, you, you make it happen. Otherwise, you will have an accident, folks. And, and so we're heading into the restroom, and, and, and he's going. And You know, kids love those automatic blow dryers that sound like a jet stream when you turn them on. Well, you know, he, he successfully made it. He was, he was okay. doesn't always happen that way, and it can be very enlightening um, what God can... That's a trial. You think you got tough, tough trials in your life. Potty training your child is a trial. But anyway, this was also a trial. You know they do things in public that you, you shouldn't do in public? Like, like he was going up to the air dryer and he'd make it go off. And you know how loud it is? All of a sudden he had to match that. So he starts in the restaurant screaming like a little girl. He just screams. And I'm, I'm just thinking, I'm so glad I'm past that stage in my life. You know, just certain things that, that hopefully I've grown up from. Now, he, did, he went on to do it about three or four times after that. And, and, uh, and I came out just kind of shamefully walking across the re- restaurant Um, in dealing with that process. But you know there's other things that I don't ever want to go through again. Puberty. Puberty. Wasn't that horrific? Guys, did you enjoy your voice change? Okay, how how many got made fun of the scratching voice or squeaking voice, you know, in junior high? Did anybody get made fun of it? Was that just me? Okay, just one over here. There's just two. Oh, three. Okay, so three of us get made. The rest of you turned into a, a deep bass voice as soon as you hit second grade, so it didn't really bother you. But, but for those of us who had to suffer through something like that, you know, you would get excited and you'd try to use your manly voice and all of a sudden go into this little high pitch, you know, and it'd crack. And there were so many, oh, it's embarrassing. But just all the other things that happened during the teenage years that... I'm just glad I am past that, aren't you? Well, when we get into our spiritual life, there are certain things that I am just so glad that I am past. I, I'm so glad that when I was 15 years old, I got saved. I'm so glad that There were people in my life at Grace Baptist Church that took the time and the effort to preach Jesus to me. But not only to preach, but to live Jesus in front of me. Anybody appreciate that? I mean, I appreciate grace in doing that. All because of the grace of God. But in, in going through that process, you know, there's something that I don't wish to go back to living a life as if I didn't know God or trying to act as if I needed to appease God. You, do, do, has, has there been some things in your spiritual walk as you've moved up and, and grown where, where you've it's finally clicked. And I was, I was talking to our Sunday school class about it this morning, and I won't get into the details. But, you know, earlier on in life, there were certain things that I believed or certain things that I was trying to live up to 
just to, just to appease God. And then it finally kicked, clicked in my mind that I don't need to appease God. Jesus did that for me. I just need to love God. And based on that love, everything's going to change. If I want to run my race, then I have to look into the author and finisher of my faith. I don't have to do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. You get what I'm saying? There was something that clicked in my life that instead of just all about doing, it became about loving God. And that changes everything about you. When you get in this passage tonight, Paul is going to continue this process that he's been talking about. Continue using an illustration that he used back in chapter 3 about growing up. And he's saying, listen, we've passed that stage. Why are you trying to run back to it? It doesn't make any sense. So it's time to grow up. Point number one, we're going to go into the perfect plan. And I just think it's wonderful. Don't rush through these verses as, as we read through them. Really try to hone in on some of the things that's coming out because there's some powerful doctrine that's on display through these verses. You go into verse number one, it says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. But is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. Even so, we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. Now, if you remember back to the context of what was going on, he actually relates to the law being a school teacher. Does anybody remember that in the last sermon that I preached? Okay. And I stated that, that it wasn't like our school teacher, Barry, Okay, or Jackie Foyle or whoever else. We, we've had a lot of school teachers that have come through grace. Um, but, but it's not necessarily like that. It was actually pointing towards a slave that was bought for the purpose of being like a, 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 a nanny in a sense. To where they would, they would follow the kids to school if they were to go to school. And they would make sure that they were going to arrive on time. How many of you had to walk to school? Anybody? Okay. Yeah, up and down the hill or whatever, you know, in uh, three feet of snow, even though that doesn't arrive in Illinois, unless it was the blizzard of 70 what? Eight. Okay. Some of you probably said something different there. But anyway, uh, did you ever struggle with going straight to school? Anybody struggle with that? Anybody would confess their sin today? It's something you haven't confessed yet. You, you had some troubles getting you know, going straight to school. Okay, listen, they had somebody that would, that would actually follow along and make sure that they got where they needed to go. And if they said something wrong, you know, if, if, they, if they said something disrespectful, listen, there was some punishment that was laid out, not by the parents in this instance. There was someone that was acting for the parents and keeping them in line. And so here he's saying, Listen, you might be a child, okay, in this sentence, an, an heir. Maybe the parents have passed, and he's using this illustration, that you're, the parents have passed away in this sense. As long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. So he's saying, listen, listen, uh, being a child, you hadn't uh, gotten to that age where you've... Um, uh, lost that temporary slave, that, that school teacher. You haven't gotten to that point to where you have full control over what's going on in the estate. You get what I'm saying? If you're an heir of something, there is certain qualifications that need to be happening before you can actually have control or charge over what's been given to you. And he's saying, listen, this heir who's gotten it, who doesn't have control, they're being guided. Yes, it's all put in their name in essence, but yet, they're still underneath this restraint. They can't have it all. It says they're under the tutors and the governors until the time appointed of the Father. There was a specific time when that burden was alleviated. In the same case, the law was a temporary restraint that was put on until the appointed time. He's using this illustration again. It says, even so, when we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. It's going back to chapter 3. 
and focusing on, you know, when we talked about even uh, the Gentiles, not only the Jews had the law that was given to them, but the Gentiles, as we see in Romans, we see that it was actually written on their hearts, some of the law. They, they have a conscience. And so, and they know that there's a God out there. As you look out into creation, you know that there's a God. You see the invisible attributes, as you see in, in, in Romans chapter 1. And so as, as you're going through that, he's saying, listen, it, it relates. Now, in this passage, it's actually going to say that we are no longer a servant or a slave, but an heir. We're going to get to that. Now, don't be confused, because you have to remember context is king. You say, wait a minute, Paul says that he was a slave multiple times. That's not what it's relating to. He's relating back to the illustration of what's going on here. He's talking about the difference between the heir, and the heir is no, no different than, than the slave until they've uh, lost this restraint, and then finally they're free from that. He's talking about the same thing. So don't don't go in and say, well, the Bible, it's contradicting itself because Paul says he's a slave there, and then he, he says he's not a slave over here. It's not contradicting. Remember the context. So he gives this illustration here, but in this perfect plan, this is, this is the beauty of the next few verses. It goes on in verse 4. It says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore, thou art no more a servant. That's what I was relating to earlier. There's no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Do you see all the, the beauty of that passage right there? If not, I'm going to go through it. As we go through this, we see the perfect plan that happened with perfect timing. Perfect timing. You see in there, it says, but when the fullness of time was come... When it had its appointed time, God sent his son. Do you ever struggle with God's timing on things? I mean, could COVID just be over? Like, just be done? I don't want to see that name in the dictionary ever again. Anybody there yet? Okay. Anybody want to have a mask burning party at the end of this thing? Okay. We're going to have a big bonfire. It's, it's going to be wonderful, right? I mean, we, we, we're just like, God, come on, get it done. Let's go. And yet, when was the perfect time? Listen, some people say that when Jesus came, it seemed like the most perfect time because of all the roadways that were built and underneath the Roman Empire and dealing with the, uh, the, the Greek Empire and all that was going on, it seemed like the most perfect time for Jesus to come. You know what is perfect about it? It wasn't about the roads and, and all the empires and all that. It's because God deemed it so at that time. That's why Jesus came. Well, why didn't Jesus come like while David was alive? Because God didn't deem it that way. He wanted him to come when there was some craziness and chaos. And, 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 and a lot of the Jews, as he stated all throughout, there's only a remnant that really fully understand and have faith in God himself. And yet that's exactly what happened. And there was so much prophecy that was given to point to this time in the fulfilled time the son was sent. Just like in the fulfilled time when a child in that uh, illustration, the child actually became of age and can loose that slave that was over him or her in the same way that Jesus Christ came in the perfect time. But you know what? It wasn't just a perfect time. It was a perfect substitute. As you look through that, it says, it says um, but when the fullness of time was come, in verse 4, God sent forth his son. His son. So that means he's, what? Deity. He's fully 
God. But then it says, made of a woman. He's fully man. Made under the law. Wait, how can you be fully God and fully man at the same time? You want me to try to explain it? We won't get to the pie this evening, all right? And, and in fact, I don't think we would to totally understand it, but it had to happen in order for there to be a perfect sacrifice so salvation could be given. It had to happen for God's wrath to be appeased, otherwise it wouldn't be. And so fully God, fully man under the law, meaning that he dealt with the same things that we dealt with. Well, he didn't have Facebook, so he doesn't have that, those kind of temptations. Believe me, it's, it's all the same thing over and over again. It's just different tools that we use for those temptations. Okay, and, and yet Jesus came, and he was tempted just as we are. He went through puberty. Now, did he go through a pu perfect puberty? I mean, was he potty trained immediately? I have no idea. It doesn't say, so it doesn't matter. But God came in, Jesus came, and he dealt with the things that we dealt with. He was under the law and fulfilled it because he didn't sin. He chose God every single day time, even when all of his emotions were pointing the opposite direction, he chose God. And here it is, Jesus, in this perfect plan and perfect timing with a perfect substitute, substitute came in. And, and do you see here the, the, um, just the, the uniqueness of the Trinity on display? God sent the Son to do all of this, and then here comes the rest of the Trinity, the third part. The Son comes to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. There's no more a servant. No more in that section where we're under the restraint of, of the law. We have now been freed from that. We're a son. A son that's an heir. Heir of God through Christ. God the Father sent the Son, and then through the Son, we have the seal of, of our salvation. And in fact, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 14, could you put that up there? Or 13. Let's start in 13. In whom... Ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, until the praise of his glory. We get a piece of the inheritance by God dwelling in us, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, Helping us understand this relationship that we have with God the Father. We not only have perfect timing and a perfect plan and a perfect substitute, but you know, we have a perfect Father. One who, who you know, a slave couldn't cry out and say, Abba, Father, because it was actually related to the term, like, Daddy. Okay? Not everybody can call me Dad. My three children, for sure, know me in the best way. They have a different idea when they say dad. Now, the teenagers in the youth group, they might at some point, when I get old enough, call me dad. Okay? He's still poppy, you know, over in the corner. I don't know. Poppy T. I don't know what it is. You know, but, but at some point, I might, I'm, I'm only 31, so I don't know if I can, I, I don't know if I'm that, at that point yet, Okay? Um, but, but you know what? They won't have the close bond that I have with my children. I love it. See, my children are still at the point where they like me coming home. Okay? Now, my oldest, maybe not so much. All right? She, she's, she's almost, she's like on that borderline. It's like, okay, daddy's here again, whatever. But my youngest... She still likes me, so I haven't done enough to ruin her yet. Do you know, I love it. 
You know, when, when we're getting ready to kind of close down the evening, I go lay down on the couch, and she crawls up. Sometimes she needs a little bit of help being hoisted up. And she just lays right next to me in this pocket. And she puts her, this is what she does. This is hilarious. She puts her arms back here, her hands behind her head, and she just relaxes. I love that. Any other dads know what I'm talking about? Okay, that's kind of picture that we're getting here. We might rib our kids. Okay, we might, we might mess with them every once in a while. We might toss them up in the air, or if you're Barry and Josh, you toss them all the way across the lobby, okay? But you know what? Emma still loves her dad, even though she hit the ground so many times on her head. Uh, I, you know, it, it makes sense. But anyway, uh, I, no, I'm just kidding. Emma, stop. All right, uh, don't judge me. Anyway, uh, but you know what? You know what I'm talking about. My kids have that close bond, and they can come to me. They know that they can come. And, and, and be loved by me and be protected by me. This past summer, we went to like a rainforest zoo. And all of a sudden, they brought the big old snake out of the cage. I thought that was a no-no, folks. All right? But one of my children ran to me and is huddled there. And Keely's yelling. She's on the other side of the snake. It was like a hallway. And she's screaming, get over here. Get over here. You know, you got to take care of your children. I'm like, I'm trying to take one right here. But I just, I just, I need to stay away. Just run that way. Okay. All right. But, but I had, I had one child. The child ran to me. Get what I'm talking about? When we cry out, when the Holy Spirit, that seal of salvation, the, 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 the first um, inkling of our inheritance that we have because we are children of God, because we are heirs, because there's a difference here with Jesus Christ and the freedom that we have, we can acknowledge God and I don't have to fear anymore. You know how many religious people there are out there wondering if they've got it good enough? Mm, I messed up today. God must hate me. Do you know what? God loves you even when you sin. And that love never changes. It's always on full. It never depletes. Well, he used too much love on Taylor, so he can't love me. No, 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 no. He's on constant full. It doesn't change. This is the beauty that Paul is trying to present. This is what we have. And it doesn't matter whether you're Jew or you're Gentile. It doesn't matter um, whether you're male or female. Or it doesn't matter whether you're working or, or a slave or not working. It doesn't matter. If you are in Christ, you are an heir. We're free. Free in Christ. We claim freedom as Americans, but it is nothing compared to the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. Nothing. So as you're going through this, we have this perfect plan. But you know what? Paul's struggling here. We go to the second point. They're abandoning the perfect plan. You go into verse 8 through 11, and it starts saying there, How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. So in this instance, when you didn't know God, when, when, when God wasn't even on your, on your radar, you served something else other than God. And in this instance, the, Galatians, they, the Galatian people, they served other false gods, okay? And in America, um, there are so many false gods that are out there. You might not have some Buddha sitting in your front porch that you bow down to, but we sure bow down to materialism. 
We sure, we sure bow down to, to, to certain sects of, 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 of politics. You know, we sure, we sure bow down to, to certain heroes. Man, uh, um, you know, if, if, if somebody like Michael Jackson, you remember when Michael Jackson passed away? Some of you probably weren't born yet, I, I know, but, but you remember when Michael Jackson passed away? That was on the news for forever. And people act as if, if they, they can't go on, right? It's like, it, it's like oh, that, it's, it's done. Remember when, when Elvis was gone? Yeah, that connects more, okay? <laughs> Some of you go to Elvis reenactments, don't you? We won't judge you right now. But man, some people, I just can't go out. He was supposed to marry me. You know, and, and I, uh, they can't live. Do you remember when Hillary Clinton didn't make it into the, as the presidency? And people freaked out. Do you remember when Trump didn't make it president a second time? Remember when people freaked out? There was some guy with like bullhorns or something. Good. He was, he was going into the Capitol. He's nuts. Well, because if Trump doesn't do this, then, 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 then it, our prophecy won't be fulfilled. We can't go on. There's so much craziness out there, okay? You know what? We lift so many things into the position that they're not supposed to be in. We, we lift religious leaders into positions that they aren't supposed to be in. We become followers of them. And then when they mess up bad, we question the faith. A lot of people might be struggling with that, with, with, with all kinds of different religious leaders that aren't doing what they want them to do in these moments and the craziness of what's going on in our government. Well, they didn't do what I thought that they should do. And so I don't know what I'm going to do. I, I, I'm going to just give up, give up. I'm just leaving the church. Da, 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 da. I mean, there, there's so many things that we put our faith in that isn't Jesus Christ. You get what I'm saying? We put all of our emotions in these things, and if it doesn't happen, listen, teenagers, sometimes the emotions are put into the girlfriend or boyfriend, and if it doesn't work out, oh, I just don't know if I can live anymore. Or teenagers, what about video games? Oh, I couldn't play for 16 hours today. I don't know if I can live my life. Mom, you're evil. You made me do homework. Oh, if I can't go to my sport, mm, boo-hoo. Or if I can't read my books, boo-hoo, right? I mean, I'm just trying to cover everything here tonight. We lift so many things up and elevate them to the point where they become godlike. Do, do you see the, here what he states? He says, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. There is nothing that has the nature of God except for God himself. There's nothing that has the character of God. There's nothing that can, that can suffice us that is enough for us except for God himself. That's it. He's saying, you are serving these other things. But then what happens in verse 9? But now after that ye have known God... You've experienced him, or is in the psalm that we went through, uh, was it a week ago? You have tasted and seen that the Lord is good, right? You've known God, or rather are known of God. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? He's, do, you, do you get what he's saying there? In a sense, you've known God, or rather, you have been known by God. In a sense that God initiated this relationship. It wasn't us that sought after him first. And I know I'm, I'm presenting some pretty crazy theology here. But God pursued you first. You were dead. I was dead. In our trespasses and sins, there's nothing good that I could do. 
God had to seek us. He, he loved us first so that we could love Him back. He initiated this knowing. He initiated this relationship so that we could taste and see that the Lord is good. And he goes on and he says, But ye have turned again to the things before. Time to grow up. Stop returning to things that don't matter. They've returned to trying to appease God by, you go on in these verses, it says, it says that, that ye observe days and months and times and years. You're trying to, to, to take on the Mosaic calendar and, and whatever the, the Judaizers are pushing your direction. If you want to be spiritual, you have to do this, 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 and this. He's saying, listen, you're trying to appease God through taking on the law when we've grown up. Jesus came. We're free from that. He fulfilled the law. You don't have to make God happy anymore in that sense. You don't have to earn your way to Him. Jesus made it happen. So why are you going to the, I love what He says, the weak and the beggarly elements because there is nothing that gets us to God in this world except for Jesus Christ. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. Everybody. All have sinned and come short of the glory. Of God. You know it's interesting. As a side note, real quick, when it's talking about God knowing us and then us knowing Him and having that relationship, everything that we try to replace with God cannot truly have a relationship with us in the right way. As God does. You know when God pursues us. Why does he pursue us? He pursues us for his glory. But he pursues us. In order to offer us salvation. For all of eternity right? He pursues us to have a relationship with us. Do you know. Do you, do you, do you know why Joseph Smith pursued people? Do you know who Joseph Smith is? Head of Mormonism. Do you want to know why he pursued people? To gain a following and to do what he wanted to do. And have many wives. And have child wives. Young teenagers. That's, that's what he wanted. Do you think he wanted the best for these people? No. Do, 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 do you think the Pope... Oof, hmm. Do you think the Pope wants what's best for you? Or do you think there's a whole lot of money going into the Vatican? And they just want to do whatever they want to do to, to get as much as they want to get in order to, to, to not take care of certain things. And there was all kinds of scandals going on and, and all that jazz. I mean, do you think really that this religious leader... Was, was trying to get you to God or, or are they truly searching the scriptures and understanding that you can't get to God through good works or heightening Mary to a level where she's not supposed to be. I mean, we can go through the list, folks. We could go all the way through the list of all those false gods that are out there and nothing does, accomplishes what God does. Because we have this hole in our heart that can only be filled by God. That's it. It can't be filled by anything else. You want to know why people are searching so hard after things? It's because there's a hole in their heart that they're trying to fill 
and they're trying to find everything else to fill it with. You know, God, God pursues us. In that last verse, I'll just read it for you here. He says, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. I'll just tell you what, that's one of the scariest verses for a, a leader, a pastor, right? That's the scariest verses for a parent. That's a, one of the scariest verses for a teacher. Um, I wonder if Barry's ever thought that he's wasted his time with certain students. I, I imagine he, he's felt like it. Have, have, has anybody, um, you know, been in a car dealership situation where you're trying to sell a car to somebody and you felt like you've totally wasted your time with that individual and it's like, man, man, I thought I had, no, no, they, no, they don't want anything. They just totally wasted my time. Or with, or, or with, you know, have you ever had a child that's gone off the wayside and you're wondering, whoa, did I waste all that time and effort on that child? I mean, this is the, the, the raw emotion that is responding here. And is he saying, is, is Paul saying, um, you know, am I wasting my time on trying to provoke you to come back to that spiritual maturity? Maybe you're already saved, but am I wasting that time? Could I spend it somewhere else? It's kind of like where pastor said uh, a few weeks ago. And he said, listen, we, we, we need to know who we're pastoring here at Grace Baptist Church. If we don't know that, our head's going in every different direction here. We need to know who we are ministering to and making sure that it's actually profitable. This is where Paul's at. So is he saying, hey, you know what? I don't know if I'm wasting my time trying to provoke you into maturity or am I wasting my, have I totally wasted my time on, on you because, because you didn't even come to Christ to begin with? I, I really don't think it's in that, on that level because he's spoken of so many things that God's done in their lives already and the testimony that's happened throughout Galatians. But, but whatever that is, he doesn't really go into much detail along those lines. But, but whatever that is, he's at the point where he's feeling like his words are falling on deaf ears. Now, this is where I just want to Close it out. God's got a perfect plan. How many times are we tempted to walk away from that? Oh, foolish Galatians. Sometimes we elevate ourselves to, to that level. And oh, I can't believe these Galatians, they did such a thing. Boo-hoo, baha. But yet, how many times are we tempted to walk away from the perfect plan that God has offered through Jesus Christ. How many times? How many times have others, through the 37 years of Grace Baptist Church, have others walked away from the faith because of that lack of faith? Jesus, they've run back to the same things that they were doing before. Maybe you haven't even come out of those weak and beggarly elements, if I can say it like that in the terms that he was using, maybe you've never been saved to begin with. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, hey, I've never been saved. I, there's the perfect plan. Why don't you take up on that offer? He offers salvation for every single one of us. Again, it's not you trying to appease God. Jesus already did that. You just have to have faith in him. And stay there. So why change what works? Or has there ever been a moment where God, you know, he's all knowing, right? But you ever thought, is God wasting his time on me? Am I just ignoring him? Am I, am I the deaf ears? You're here tonight. God's speaking. 
Is there something that we need to just wake up, clean our ears out, see the reality, stop pursuing the weak and beggarly elements, and start pursuing God? Start acting like we're heirs of the faith. Start acting like we're children of God. Are you there tonight?